All right, friends, we have been busy in the comments section and I think it's actually time for another fireside chat here because new uh, information is coming in and I'm sure that you're hoping some of these predictions are wrong, but I gotta give you my thoughts. So let's get into it. What is going on, you beautiful humans? Welcome back to the channel. And yes, today what I wanna do is actually expand on some rumors and predictions coming in from Ming-Chi Kuo. I, of course, will link up those resources. But if you haven't been hanging around the channel, if you haven't really understood what I've been doing here, I have actually tested these machines, the M1 MacBook Air and of course the M1 Mini. And I'm actually gonna be testing th these machines continuing for gaming. I've got an eGPU right over here with an Intel machine. I'm gonna pit that against the M1 Mac Mini. We're gonna see how that all plays out. Now, of course, for those Windows users, I know it might be laughable to think that a Mac is a gaming machine, but here's the thing, I am not here to fight. Because the thing is, is with all of this M1 talk, it is pushing things forward for ARM, for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So in the end, the consumer is gonna win here and even having more choice for developers. Although I understand that for the development, that there's a lot of overhead there and you really need a market for that. So the, there might be a smaller return, but it's coming. And of course, you know, the funny thing is, is that the M1 talk, all of this happening, has actually pushed Intel out there and curating some very creative benchmarks when it comes to uh, what's happening with those chips and how it compares to the M1 Mac. And you know my feelings on the benchmarks. I, I do think it's a, a fine place to start, but I'm all about actually using it, real world use case. And I do things a little bit differently around here, but that's the thing with this curated benchmark. And of course I will link that up, but I think it's just kind of hilarious that Intel, of course, you know, a little frightened, but it should just move them forward. I mean, they've been around for a while. Now I'm not gonna give you that spiel about this is what you actually have to do. Like this is what you have to do, but rather giving you some information, my thoughts on what you've been waiting for when it comes to the 14 inch MacBook Pro and the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Now, from the rumors, it seems that the MacBook Air is likely gonna be sticking around at an entry-level Ultrabook to allow customers to get into the space, to get into that lower price point. And I think the 14-inch being rumored to take the place of the current 13-inch MacBook Pro, I think that's happening, and of course, with a new design. Of course, all as to the design, you know, I could see this as almost a very similar footprint as the 13 inch model by shrinking the bezels and basically what Apple did with the iPhone 12 mini and the SE2 where the edge to edge display on the 12 mini is actually a larger to screen, like it's a larger screen, but it's, it's a smaller footprint than the SE2 and I've actually done a video on that. And of course, speaking of the iPhone and of course the iPad and the iPad Air, I love the design there and it actually has been discussed about the rounded flatter design and which I don't know how that's gonna look. I think until we see it, uh, it's there's gonna be some mixed feelings about it. And I, I do love the look, but I'm just kind of wondering about how that'll equate to not just the design, but the, the how comfortable the typing experience is gonna be. And of course, you know, while we're on that typing, it seems that the touch bar is definitely getting edged out. And likely that's probably from either a cost issue and or just the fact that apps and software haven't fully utilized it like as it has been intended. So again, as I said in my last video, I am sorry for your loss on that muscle memory. But here's the rub. And this is, I think, where you might be asking yourself whether it's worth the wait because it seems that the rumored uh, specs of the 14 inch and having a different like sort of sort of thermal footprint and utilizing the, the similar uh, setup that the current Intel 16 inch MacBook Pro has, I don't know that that automatically equates for the 14 inch to get the M1X or whatever it's gonna be called. I have a feeling that the M1 could still be offered as that entry point, as that starting point into the ecosystem and then there's the upgrade option, the chipset to the M1X, but that's gonna come at a cost. So going back to the 1299 US dollars, where I think that that's where they're gonna stick for the baseline, you know, still the same two ports potentially at the baseline, and although likely MagSafe is coming into play and potentially an SD card slot, I also think the base is gonna come in with eight gigs of RAM, so potentially with that 1299. And you know, here's the thing, 
Regardless of whether you think Apple is saving money by making these chips and foregoing the markup from Intel and that they'll pass that on to the consumer, here's the thing, every company has got an R&D budget and Apple has it in, of course, their gear, their own R&D, and it's a line item that actually needs revenue, just saying. But going further, whereas the upgraded version that could land several hundred dollars more, maybe even like flirt with $17.99 US, which I've actually talked about that. I mean, that is kind of along the lines of the previous 13 inch models did. They had the baseline 13 inch and then the upgraded version at around $17.99. So with that bump, still it, it could come with an M1X, but still with eight gigs of RAM and likely, you know, the Thunderbolt options, like additional Thunderbolt options, and maybe even the feature of mini LED display. However, I don't think that they would not put the mini LED display in the baseline 14 inch, um, because I think honestly, that would be a very poor decision and creating the mini LED as a feature for the upgraded uh, 1799. Not to mention, it really does actually complicate the manufacturing logistics there on their end. And so I, I don't think it makes much sense. But let me quickly pivot into some questions and answers that I've gotten on the channel before we get into this 16 inch MacBook Pro setup, because many of you have reached out about Apple's desire to infiltrate the office environment. And especially for those of you who are saying, well, you gotta be a creator to like want a Mac? No. The full context here is that I spend time as an owner of a company in the business space and healthcare of all things. And yes, for those of you that might ask or want to question whether you can own, run, and represent a company wearing a t-shirt, a beanie, and I haven't had a haircut in like since March, yeah, because I've actually cultivated a culture where the clothes don't represent the person necessarily and rather the people being kind, a team player, and just a good work ethic. So if you don't wanna work with me, then don't. I account for that and you know, having that as a choice is awesome, your loss. But stepping down off of my soapbox and driving to the point here that, let me just say that for a company being able to, you know, implement uh, Mac OS into that ecosystem, the level of Mac OS that we have integrated, I wanted to build an entire workflow and software around that, that ecosystem. The world of the x86 architecture, really that the Windows PC is more friendly from a software standpoint, and also the ability to upgrade the machines for, this, for the software. And many of my friends and colleagues that work in that corporate world reiterate that those employees that actually have a Mac are typically in a creative role uh, within the company. Now, I know that's not everyone, I totally get it. I know that that's not everyone's situation, but I feel like I needed to mention it and stake my claim that I don't think Apple is really all that interested in crushing spreadsheets. Do they want more market share? Yeah, of course, but they also understand that the integration of their systems into that space is still a massive undertaking. So I'm not saying that these machines aren't for the non-creative because I've turned my company into a Mac-friendly environment, but I'm just telling you that you know, because it comes down to what you need this machine to do. So if you have the tool that doesn't actually serve your needs, then you really should actually just take that into consideration, which can be a reason to consider the baseline M1 MacBook Air as an option, you know, because especially the price point. And if you have no desire or plan to ever push the machine to the brink, it's really a similar, similar argument, like for me to get a gaming rig if I don't game. But for those of you that are in the creative space and or might be just getting started in it and likely working with camera footage and codecs, uh, you know, the M1, it can safely handle that, such as, you know, the 8-bit 4K that I talk about and even 10-bit that I've worked with, but also those of you asking about GoPro footage or filming with your iPhone. Yes, the M1 can handle it. I mean, have you seen what I've been doing with these things around here? Which leads me to the excitement that many of you may have for the 16-inch MacBook Pro. Now, how Apple is gonna differentiate here, I'm not exactly sure, but we'll say that, you know, taking that similar design and footprint as they would with the 14 inch, deciding that, okay, this is actually gonna have four USB-C ports or possibly three, especially if they add, add that MagSafe in for charging, but that this chipset will likely include more power cores and potentially an upgraded option of up to 32 cores. 
But actually, let's roll that back a little bit because I think that this could potentially start at 16 cores with the GPU still existing on the chip because that 32 could potentially be reserved for their desktop solutions. However, if Apple decides to also, you know, use discrete graphics, um, such as, you know, the ones from AMD that they have, then this is actually where things could get really interesting, but also have a massive jump in price to the mid 3000 US dollar range or, or more. So not to mention that these updated chips being able to work with eGPUs, but at, you know, at that point, you may even wonder like how that's even going to help. I mean, I love eGPUs, but you know, I'll be testing it, you know, as an option, but I'm still not sure about that. So the thing is though, is that AMD also has their own manufacturing delays right now. And the mobile graphics that they are touting, I mean, they seem really promising, but you know, at a cost to what Apple is claiming as far as their efficiency is concerned. I mean, how that'll fully take advantage of the optimized software and would that just cause like more conflict with the, with the claims of the ecosystem and really how this will impact the battery life. So with MagSafe coming back, that would certainly free up some ports uh, when it comes to minimizing our need and use of hubs, looking at those docking stations. And I actually wonder how those manufacturers are gonna pivot because I do think a few of us will still need to work with hubs and docking stations, but the added SD card, I mean, seriously, like having that SD card slot back would definitely be a welcome feature. But I also think that many of you that aren't uh, in that filmmaking space, working with mirrorless cameras, and really you're just filming with iPhones, which is totally fine, but you're basically just airdropping or using iCloud for that footage. So the SD card slot might be a moot point. But if they have the space in the chassis, then I mean, why not add that as, as a feature? Because Apple has definitely missed serving a market that I think that they really wanna get back to and find some footing with because you know a lot of these creatives just got really miffed and moved over to Windows, especially for those of you who are in that Adobe software ecosphere, because it, it seems to actually work better on those machines. I mean, just saying, but for those of you that are really fully taking advantage of the Adobe suite and doing everything that it can possibly do, I, I mean, I would agree with that. Now, as far as the Apple event is you know, coming up in about a month or so, when, when can we expect as far as the launch? Um, because I did actually buy my first MacBook Pro in April of 2010. So, you know, that being said, are we gonna see the MacBooks or is this really just more of an iPad event or with the Apple TVs? Which plenty of people are waiting for the Apple TVs. I mean, you know, like it, it's happening and of course those redesigns are happening but to be able to launch the 14 inch and the 16 inch together, then we're really, I think, looking more toward the middle of the year, closer to Q3, maybe even possibly the end of Q3. And here's the thing, what if the 16 inch doesn't have that 32 core option? Then is this a kick in the teeth because on paper it doesn't look good enough? And you know, it may also come down to being twice the price of the 14 inch where that might start. And so you might actually feel that there's just not enough differentiation there and you needing to build your, your rig out even more to make it feel pro. So, I mean, let's temper those expectations again and realize that now this is actually where Apple, Intel, AMD are all pushing things and they're pushing things in the favor of the consumer, but they're still growing pains and mostly in our wallets. But as a creative, a student, or someone in business, if you have the software that'll actually work on the M1 right now, and maybe even in the near future, and you're not looking to purchase like a camera with a starting price of 3,500 US dollars that likely actually has a codec that needs a, a bit more muscle, although there are plenty of cheaper cameras that have a difficult codec to work with, but I'm just trying to make a point. The M1 is still like, it's still a little beast. And as much as I love the iPhone cameras, holding out for a 16 inch MacBook Pro just to edit iPhone footage, you know, that might not be the best use of your hard earned dollars, but you know, hey, listen, it's your money, it's your decision. If you're waiting to build something and the tool is available now, then should you keep waiting? I'm just, you know, one voice in a sea of many, but I just wanna know what you're hoping for. 
I would love to know. And, you know, as I always say, let's actually hang out in the comment section below because, you know, this is where I'm at and certainly over on Twitter. So let's get out of here on this one. You go out there and do those things that matter. You keep rocking the faces. I'm going to keep creating value for you here. So you go do the things and I'll catch you right back here on the next one.